a Rocky, Flora Monroe, Miles Harps, Alroy Dejolet, Ida Pranto, Pablo Pincott, Joe Raithby, Sue Anderson, Inga Trotz, Chrissy Brett, Dino Boomer Bundy, Brendan Edwards, Wally Maristy, Lenora Louise Blue, Earl Grey Eyes, Dave Butler, Miles Brett, Hugh Cameron. 18 names, 18 lives extinguished in just one calendar year. 18 Van Du members, my friends, people I love. Ricky, who was never late for his shifts, distributing brooms and supplies to the Hastings Tent City. Flora, who took me into the Van Du family and taught me how to speak. Miles, who called me the little man with a big voice, who was so proud to show me a photo, a family photo album that he kept safe even after years of living on the street. Elroy, whose laugh was legendary, booming down to Hastings Street. Pablo, who survived the winter's hotel fire, who dazzled all of us with his magnificent leathers. Joe, Van Du Vice President, who in his last days still wanted to go to battle with the PHS for never repairing the elevator in his building. Sue, a little lady who fought cancer off not once, not twice, but three times. Inga, a rebel born in St. Petersburg who would become a scourge, a scourge to slumlords and park rangers. Boomer, who I waited in line for the Carnegie outreach for hours listening to earth, wind, and fire. Brendan and Wally, two proud gay indigenous men who lit up our office with their smiles. Blue, a street leader and mortal enemy to the city street sweepers. Earl, who shook your hand every time you saw him. Dave, he was a real grouch, but he softened up quite a bit in the three years I knew him. And Miles Brent, Young Miles, who even days before his death applied to the Van Du board to give back to this organization that he loves so much. And Hugh, Hugh Cameron, we just learned of his death today. I spoke to his sister this morning. Hugh was a proud drug user, a brilliant and curious mind. He was 31 years old, just one year younger than me. I know he would have been marching with us here today. These 18 lives were not claimed by the drug war as if it were some kind of natural force or even crueler. Just something that happens in this neighborhood. No, these 18 friends were killed. They were murdered. They were murdered by a barbaric system shaped by human hands, manned by human will. Collecting their names, I struggled. I struggled for language to express the grief and the anger and the loss of the devastation. Groping, I, I found the words. I found the words. I found solace and understanding in the words of George Jackson. A young black revolutionary jailed from youth and assassinated by a racist government. He said, perfect love and perfect hate. That's what's inside me. Love is not an easy thing to come by. It is shaped. It is worked on. It is made perfect in the forge of struggle, in the heat of collective survival. The downtown east side is a place where love is tested. And that is what makes our love so powerful. Because it is earned. And perfect hate. Friends, we should not be afraid to express our hatred for our oppressors. For those who profit from our suffering. Who bring hope from our hearts. Who look on with indifference. And the misery and the massacre of our loved ones. If our enemies have our hands shackled behind our backs, we only have two 
two tools to free ourselves. Perfect love and perfect hate. We must sharpen those tools. So, it's Compassion Club was love made into action. Two individuals faced with the promise of certain death of all those that they cared for risked their freedom to answer a riddle that has supposedly plagued modern science and society. But the answer is obvious. Drug users throughout time have known the answer. Give people the drugs they need! This simple formula gave us a way out. Every day we are reminded that the drug war has a history. A history of colonial genocide. A history of racist domination. A history of labor exploitation. A history of gender violence. A history felt like an unending nightmare in the perpetual present. But Dulce Compassion Club, we can finally see the end of this wretched story and have the freedom to dream of a future. But on, but on October 25th, the hatred of our enemies prevailed. The VPD arrested and raided the homes of Eris Nix and Jeremy Calico, who now potentially who now potentially face charges in the highest courts of this stolen land. Like the cowards would, lo would long known them to be the government claimed ignorance, despite the fact that Dulce has been doing social action to save lives for three years in the open public. They signed off on it. So here's a tip for the VPD's so-called investigation. Read a goddamn newspaper <laughs> and flip through the glossy pages of Time magazine the next time you're clocking overtime hours sitting on the toilet. <laughs> so why raid Dolph now? The arrest and raid were undoubtedly planned to distract from and discredit what should have been a historic day in drug policy history. The completion of Dolph's one-year compassion club, a clear demonstration of life-saving outcomes of community-controlled, demedicalized, safe supply. The police and the profiteers they serve could not, they could not accept the success of this project, one that promised to save lives and reduce fatal police interactions. These death dealers knew that safe supply could mean that the ever-growing police budgets and public money siphoned into the treatment industry could be returned to the hands of the people. Remember, folks, the police don't just kill with their bullets, they kill with their budgets. Yeah! And so the dream of dope, of safe supply, of compassion clubs, of compassion itself, they were assassinated on October 25th. Who ordered this hit? Who plotted this attack on a community that yearned for an alternative to the street supply? To pin the blame solely on ex-cop and Surrey MLA Eleanor Sturko would be to grossly, grossly overestimate her intellect. <laughs> so perhaps it was her boss, BC United leader Kevin Falcon, whose repugnant anti-poor rhetoric and gross and disgusting chest-thumping law and order pageantry it's a thin cover for his real interest. Let me remind you folks, when he was Minister of Health, he cut $36 million from the budget and deregulated the treatment and recovery industry. Who would become his top donors in return for their gift? $360 million that Kevin Falcon cut from the health budget. Remember, today, today, the hatred of drug users and the poor is a bipartisan agenda. Take NDP Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, Jennifer Whiteside. Jennifer Whiteside, who ordered the defunding of Delft within six hours of Kevin Falcon and his gang staging a televised tantrum. 
rather than defend her party's stated support for safe supply, Whiteside was happy, happy to capitulate to the opposition and sell Dolph down the river. Yes! It would be, it would be naive to call for her resignation. Why? Why? Because it would falsely assume that the, that her post and the entire Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions was at all in the benefit of the public. We should abolish that ministry altogether. But despite despite the various embarrassments that Whiteside has presided over in her short tenure, we all know whose marching orders she follows and obeys. David Eby. David Eby. And despite his saintly pretensions and his well-trodden origin story of being a Catholic missionary preaching the good word of social justice on the downtown east side, he has presided over the most draconian escalation of police power and punishment that this province has seen in ten years. Evie, eager to convince us that he wasn't simply handed the premiership after Daddy Horgan stepped down, is desperately trying to revamp and beef up his image as a pencil neck bureaucrat by stoking and preying upon the fear of the society's outcast and abandoned poor. Dolph's arrest is only the culmination of a year-long project to dismantle and delegitimize harm reduction in favor of martial law. Since taking the reins, E.B. has completely reversed track on his party's small steps towards decriminalization by proposing legislation to ban public use of drugs, a dystopian future that we gave, he gave us a preview of in the paramilitary police action to decamp Hastings this April. Man in ten cities threatening and playing footsie with mandatory treatment, regressive moves towards so-called bail reform, EB has made record time in the race to shamelessly betray and slander a community he so proudly parades on his CV. David fucking Evie, get the get the name of our neighborhood out of your mouth. But friends, what we face in this crashly political face of a drug war is bigger and better organized than these two pitiful political parties. It is a nationwide campaign fueled by revenge against the gains of our movement, the media class, the trained. Dogs of Canada's esteemed media monopolies have waged a deadly war of words on prescribed safer supply. What Adam Zemo's murderous libel and Aaron Gunn's lurid propaganda have in common is a bank account. A powerful arsenal stockpiled by the real estate developers like Peter Wall, who took down the Yale Town OPS this year. So today's demonstration has no easy targets. It has no particular effigy to burn in this public square. We must indict this entire system, which on October 25th confirmed to us just how every piece of its diabolical machinery is moving against the survival of our friends and loved ones. We can now have no doubt that our elected officials and the enlightened class of bureaucrats and officials that serve them have abandoned any remaining pretense of rational or compassionate rule over the masses. The downtown east side has known this public secret and it's time we listen. The government is trying to kill us! God, drug users gave this government, gave this society the gift of harm reduction. It was a gift born of the expert knowledge of survival against certain death. Countless lives were lost in the pursuit of this miraculous science. And what did they do with it? They wrung it out for every drop of prestige and profit, and now they will toss it like a rag into the dustbin of history. Will we let them do that? No! no! Fucking way.
Friends, it is our duty and responsibility to restore harm reduction as a movement principle, a movement priority, a movement practice. What Gandalf gave us was a blueprint. The Compassion Club is not some crude intellectual property. It is a weapon to be wielded by the people in service of human life. It is our responsibility, all of us, all of you, to honor Dolph and the countless drug user rebels before them by taking action. Because the government will not give us safe supply, then we must take it by any means necessary! And Bud Osborne, brand new founder and poet warrior of the downtown east side once said, he reminds us, there is no one to care if you do not care. Dolph as we know it, it may be too soon to say, but Dolph as we know it is dead. Blessed was its flame with one, ju just one spark ignited a prairie fire. And from its ashes, may a thousand doves blossom across Turtle Island and around the world. I want to end today with the opening lines of a poem by Frank O'Hara, Ode to Joy. We shall have everything we want, and there'll be no more dying. <laughs>